giving attention to this passage. Um, and I th I'm just not doing justice. Now, I, I redid the notes a little bit, um, but and I have your notebooks up here. Did anybody take one? Okay. There's your notebooks. Got it all done. And uh, it's thicker than about all the others. It is uh, printed back, back in front. It took uh, 2,400 pages, I think it is, to do all those books. That's an offer to reimburse the church for the paper, but jo Joanne said we were good, so not to worry about it. So thank God for Joanne. All right, let's have a person when we get started. Father, I want to thank you for uh, this part of God's Word, John 14, 15, 16, and 17. And Lord, as as you know, for a long time, for years even, uh, as I studied that passage and just went through John periodically, uh, I, I often read it through the eyes of the disciples and not through the eyes of a New Testament Christian who knows all of the truth that God has revealed to us in his word. And um, I, I'm grateful, Father, for the sources that you led me to just in the last six months that really opened up to me or articulated for me the thoughts that I had as I looked into this passage. And I want to thank you for helping me to put the study together. Uh, I hope I want to thank you for the notebook you helped me put together. I appreciate uh, Kathy Kress who helped with the, uh, the details of the printing and the collating and the punching of holes and Susie who got the, uh, the, the folders for me and just thank, thankful for all the help I had, Lord. And, putting that together, and I pray as we hand these out uh, at the close today when we're finished that, Lord, we'll take these books home and we will treasure them, not because uh, it was put together by me, that's not, it didn't take my name off of it, uh, what's important is the scriptures within its pages and the, uh, the explanations and the application, Lord, as we see how these truths impacted the disciples who did not have the book of Romans, did not have Corinthians or Ephesians or 1 Peter or 1 and 2 and 3 John. They didn't have Revelation. And, uh, and yet the, this, these, this passage, this teaching and preaching, the last sermon of the, of the preacher from heaven uh, is so important, so deep. And now we come to the prayer, the closing prayer, Lord, called the Holy of Holies in the New Testament. Lord, I feel like uh, we need to wash our hands. Uh, before we pick up our Bible today and look into it. Father, I, I'm just so dependent upon the Holy Spirit uh, to help me speak these words, and, and I know we're all uh, dependent upon Him to open our hearts and our understanding that we might uh, receive that which you have for us. So we want to thank you, Father, for your word. We want to thank you for a church that honors your word and, and teaches and preaches and upholds your word, and, and that's such a blessing to my own life. Now, Lord, uh, guide us, we pray. Thank you for all those that are here. There are a number that are not here uh, that let me know they couldn't be here today and for, for reasons beyond their control. Bless them, we pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right, so we finished up in chapter 16. That was the real sermon. And he says in verse 33 of, of chapter 16, These things I've spoken unto you. And that's referring to chapter 14, 15, 16. These things, this sermon I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. Because they weren't having peace. Chapter 14 starts off, Let not your heart be troubled. Don't be shaken up. Don't be disturbed. Don't have an earthquake in your soul. You believed in God, believe also in me. Believing in me is the same as believing in God because I am God. And so he says in the last verse of chapter 16, these things I've spoken, this sermon I've preached, that you might have peace. Because he told them in 14, 15, and 16 that yes, he's going away. No, they won't see him anymore. Yes, he's going to die some mysterious death they didn't yet understand, but they will. But he's going to come back one day. They didn't know about the kingdom. All that was confusing to them. He, he was going to die and be gone. They wouldn't see him. But he's going to send what? Who? The Spirit. The Counselor. Another Comforter 
someone to t- if he's the first comforter and the Spirit of God is the second comforter, and the second comforter is going to pick up where Jesus left off, and he's going to continue on Jesus' ministry. It was interesting to me when Pastor Josh was preaching in John in Acts chapter one. Um, look what it says in Acts chapter one. This is cool. When I say cool, I mean biblical and exciting. Okay, I don't mean cool like the beatniks meant back in the sixties. The former account, he says, I made oath the, and the former account means the book of Luke. That's the first thing Luke wrote. That former account, the book of Luke, I made oath Theophilus of all that Jesus, what's the next word? Began both to do. He didn't say, that former account I wrote that I made oath Theophilus of all that Jesus did and taught. No, he began to do and preach. If you begin something, the implication to me is you're going to continue on doing it. I just began it. See, I began preaching when I was 19. I began teaching and preaching when I was 19. I began serving in church when I was 19. And I hear him 71, and I'm still doing it. That's when, when he says... In chapter 1 of Acts, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He began to do it. It's still, he's still doing it. But he's doing it how? Through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is still doing his work through the Holy Spirit. He's living in us. The spirit of truth, the spirit of God, is the spirit of Jesus Christ, the spirit of Christ, and he lives in us. And all those great things that Jesus did, the sermons he preached, the parables, the teaching, all of that. Can I help you, sir? Okay. All right. Um. So the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry continues on in the church through the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you think you would go to the church? You go what? Oh, oh, Ronnie, it's okay. Mickey said the, the AVHC people were here over there, so thank you, Mickey. Can't be too, too safe today. All right. So he says, I spoke these things that you might have peace. Told him about the Holy Spirit, all he's going to do, the second coming, all of that. Now we come to chapter 17. Let's pick it up here. Jesus spoke these words, and then he prayed. Look at he says. He lifted up his eyes to heaven. Well, I like to see that. He spoke these, and then he lifted up his eyes to heaven. You know, by this time, they had left the upper room. They were walking through the city on the way to the Mount of Olives. And it doesn't reflect it here, but it tells us in chapter 18, verse 1, that after he had spoken those words, that that is the prayer in chapter 17, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden. So they're on the this side of the city. There's the Kidron Valley and the Kidron Brook that ran through it. And there's the Mount of Olives. And there is uh, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane up there. So they're on this side and they go across. So in chapter 17, verse 1, they're still on that side, the Jerusalem side of the brook. And he starts to pray. And you can take this prayer and you can divide it up in a number of ways. There's several outlines and you'll see it in the notebook. Most divided into three parts. One says, uh, it's Jesus and his father, verses 1 through 5. Jesus and his current disciples, verses 6 through 19. Jesus and his future disciples, that'd be us, verses 20 through 26. One preacher or theologian said, verses 1 through 5 is glorification. 6 through 8 is revelation. 9 through 12 is protection. 13 through 19 is sanctification. 20 through 23 is unification. And 24 through 26 is reunification. That's a little more detail than I was interested in. 
My own outline is like this. One through five, Jesus looked upward. He says he looked up. Verses six through 19, he looked outward. He looked towards his current disciples. And then 20 through 26, he looked forward. He looked to those who would believe in the future through the words and the testimony and the ministries of his 11 disciples, soon to be 12 once they chose Malachi, uh, Matthias. Well, let's look at the first. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Now, what hour is he talking about? The, what hour? His death. He'd been looking for that hour. It was to that hour he was born. That's why he's been living his life all this time for that hour. Go back to chapter 12. Just back a few, this is before he started the sermon. Chapter 12, 23 and following. But, Philip, but, but Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. That where I am, there my servant will be. Also, if anyone serves me, him my Father will honor. And then he says in verse 27 of chapter uh, 12. Now my soul is troubled. Why was his soul troubled the night before he was, the night he was betrayed? He knew what was coming. Was coming. And we saw last week, he, 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 he didn't know that simply because he was God and he knew everything. Remember we saw in the scriptures that he had limited some of his, his, his attributes. He had emptied himself and he didn't have the omniscience that he had when he was with the Father. He didn't have the omnipresence that he had when he was with the Father. He limited himself. He gave up some of the rights of his deity. And omniscience was one of them. He had to grow in his wisdom. He had to increase in his knowledge. And so he had to study like any other Jewish boy did. He had to go to synagogue like any other Jewish boy did. He had to read Isaiah and Joel and Ezekiel and Malachi and, and, uh, and Micah to learn all the things about the coming Messiah. And as he read those things, it dawned on him, especially the book of, of, uh, of Isaiah about the suffering servant. He realized, I'm the one. I, I'm the lamb. It hit him as he read the scriptures. And so we come here in chapter 12, and he says, Now my soul is troubled, verse 27. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified and I'll glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said, it, it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, verse 30, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the rule of the world cast out. And I, if I be lifted, listen, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And he said this signifying by what death he would, would die. So he, he was anticipating his dying. That was the hour. The hour has come. And he says to the Father, back to 17, verse 1, uh, verse 2, uh, verse 1, Glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. Now, why did the death of Jesus glorify the Father and glorify the Son? Remember, when was the first reference in Scripture of the Messiah dying? Very first reference. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When God was talking to the woman after she and Adam had sinned against God, and he said that, the, that, that, that your seed will bruise his heel, meaning a, a, a temporary flesh wound, that Satan is going to bruise the seed of the woman, his heel. But the seed of the woman would do what to the head of the serpent? Crush it. You, he will bruise your head, and that word bruise means to crush. 
And so that's the hour that he's coming for, and that's how God is going to be glorified because that fulfills this great redemptive program that God had planned going way back to Genesis 3 and before that because the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. The death of the Messiah was predetermined before there was ever a creation. Before God said, let there be light, he knew the son would one day die. All that was planned in time immemorial as God had, God the Father had designed a plan by which he could create a universe and a world of people who would fall into sin. And yet through a great program of redemption involving his son and the Holy Spirit, he would redeem a people to give as a gift to his son a love gift, and we'll see this in chapter 17 so very clearly, a love gift that God is going to take like a, like a, a husband gets a, a gift for his wife on the wedding day and presents her a wonderful gift. Maybe it's a new house, maybe it's a new car, a beautiful ring or something like that, but he gives her a gift to show how much he loves her. And so the father, wanting to show the son how much he loves the son, has his great redemptive people of which you and I have the privilege of being a part, a love gift, where the Father shows the Son just how much, shows the universe, shows the angels, shows the, the demons and Satan himself how much he loves the Son by giving him a redeemed people, and you're part of it. He said, where do you get all that? And we'll see it in chapter 17, so hang on. Father, the hour has come. Verse 1, glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. When Jesus died on the cross, that glorified the father by his death, and the son glorified the father by his submission to that cross. He says in verse, 20, verse 2, chapter 17, as you have given him authority over all flesh. Now think about that. God the Father gave God the Son authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Now you think about that. Did you know you were a gift of God the Father to God the Son? Whether you were 5 years old or 50 years old, or in my case 18, you were a gift. And we see that several times in, in John 17. He simply says this, he said, and read it again. You have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So as, as the Father gives you, as the Father gave Sue Grimm to the Lord Jesus, on whatever day she was saved, whether she was five-year-olds or whatever, whatever, married or not, teenager or not, mother or not, when the Father gave her to the Son, the Son gave her eternal life. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Verse 3. She was a gift to the Son from the Father. And the Spirit of God came into her. And the Son, the Spirit of, Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of Christ. He came in. He's with her always. He's with you always. I'm thinking about this authority that Jesus had. Go back to chapter 5 in, uh, in John. John chapter 5, verse 25. This is interesting. In fact, I was reviewing this morning, and I, and I did this weeks and weeks, a couple of months ago, actually, but just this morning, I saw it. Chapter 5, verse 25. Most assuredly, Jesus said, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him what? authority or power to execute judgment also because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice that is the voice of the son of God and they'll come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life that means those who have trusted in Christ is, is for salvation and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation 
He said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So when he says, going back to chapter 17, when he says that he has been given authority, He can raise the dead. He has that power to do that. So when you and I are dead in our graves, whenever that is, and Jesus comes back, and he ra- we, we said of this in our Sunday school class just this past Wednesday in Revelation, uh, Philippians chapter 3, how God is going to transform our lowly bodies and be conformed to Christ's glorious body. That's going to happen at the resurrection. After we're dead, because we've trusted Christ for our salvation, he died for us, rose again for us. And when, when we're dead and our bodies are buried or cremated, it doesn't even be blown apart to atoms. It doesn't matter because God can put it all back together. Susie gets a puzzle. She loves puzzles. And she, the, more, the, the more pieces, the better she likes it. Thousand-piece puzzles doesn't inter, doesn't. In, intimidate her thousand piece puzzle she puts it all together makes it good listen that's 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 all your body is when it decays it's just a big puzzle now it's atoms and molecules and all and maybe scattered but that's no big deal to god because god is what all powerful omniscient omnipotent eternal it's it's child's play for him to take a body that's been cremated or a body that's been decimated or a body that's decayed and put it back together and make it like Jesus. It's going to be great. And Jesus has that authority. The Father gave it to him. And, and, and so Jesus is praising the Father, glorifying the Father for this. He says in verse uh, 4, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave me to do. What was the work? The work that he gave me to do was to raise up these disciples, instill his life, his truth into them, save them, prepare them to be his apostles, and not just them. On the day of Pentecost, how many disciples were in the upper room? Somebody say 120. Take 12 from 120. What do you have? Come on. 108, and then take Judas out of that, you got 107, right? 107 disciples, we don't know all their names. We know some of them, you got Mary, you got, uh, you got those disciples going on the road to Emmaus in chapter 24 of Luke. So the, and, and remember in chapter 10 of Matthew, he sent 70 out. That would have included the 12, so it would have been 58 unnamed disciples went out and cast out demons and preached the gospel and healed the sick and raised the dead. So there's a lot of disciples here. That was part of the work. He raised up the early church before it was a church, before Pentecost. But these were believers who left Judaism, who turned away from the the, the work salvation of Judaism and turned to the Son of God who shed his blood, was going to rise from the dead, and trusted his his, his, his sacrifice for their salvation. That was the, the, the... the embryonic church, you might say, the, the church in seed form that you come across in Acts chapter 1 and 2 when the Spirit comes down and then, trans, and then they became the real church. This is the embryonic church. But that's the work God gave him to do. And he's getting ready to die on the cross and on the third day rise again from the dead. All of that glorified the Father. And then he says in verse 5, And now, O Father, why did he say, oh, Father? When you say, women, when you say to your husband, oh, oh, David, oh, Ron, oh, Don, you know, doesn't that kind of, it's, it's a term, I think, of endearment, right? You might be exasperated, oh, Ron, Ron oh, David, you did it again, you know, but it's a term of, of affection, of endearment that you're special, and I think when he says, oh, Father, oh, Father, oh, Father, my Father, with whom I was before the foundation of the world, we were face to face before the world was. Oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory 
which I had with you before the world was. And you think about that. There's a lot of things to think about in this view. How many times have I said that? I'll have to watch the video. But it's amazing. Glorify me together with yourself. In other words, oh, Father, glorify both of us with the same glory which I had with you before the world was. You see, when Jesus left heaven and was conceived in the womb of that young girl Mary by the Holy Spirit, who was betrothed to Joseph, who had no clue what was going on at that time. When that Son of God left heaven and came to earth as an embryonic child in the womb of Mary, he had been dwelling in the, with the glory of the Father before the foundation of the world. You say, well, what is the glory of God? After reading and studying, lost track of the experts, I got to tell you, I don't really know. It's, it's that what Paul calls the un, unapproachable light that no man can go into. No man, it's, just a, it's a bright, celestial, eternal light that if you stare at it, it'll blind you. No man has seen God at any time. Why? Because he dwells in a light. That's why God didn't let Moses or come up on the, just let Moses come up. He didn't want the people to come up. And he shielded him in that rock. I want to see your glory. Well, I want to get in that rock and I'll show you the hind parts. Because no man has seen God and lived. The bright, celestial, eternal light of God, that glory of God the Father had with, with the Son and the Son had with the Father before the world was. The first word that comes to mind in these first five verses is glorify. Glorify me. I'm going to glorify you. With that glory we had, back before there was a, before there was a universe, we had such fellowship. You and me and the Holy Spirit, the three of us, the three in one, the only true God. He says in verse 3, we didn't even mention this spend much time on that but he says and this is eternal life that I may that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent that's the he calls him the only true God if he's the only true God does that mean there's any other gods no they're only demons masquerading as gods that's what, the, that's what the writer of, of uh, the Old Testament says very clearly. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter, I think it's 10 or 11, he talks about uh, coming to the table of demons. These are coming to worship in the temples of demons because false religions are really uh, inspired, empowered, and designed by demons to, to deceive and take people away from the truth. He's the one true God. He's the only God. He says, I glorified you on the earth. It says in chapter 1 of 14, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 14. If you want to turn there, you can. If you don't want to, that's okay. I'm going to read it. I quoted it a second ago, but I may not have quoted it in full. He says, and the word became flesh, that's Jesus, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And Jesus wants to glorify himself. He wants to glorify the Father. The Father's going to glorify him at Calvary and at the resurrection. Amazing thing. Then we come to chapter, still chapter 17, but... Um, Notice what it says um, in verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. What's manifest mean? We talked about this a, a good bit earlier on. Manifest means to make clear. Remember, the idea comes from the guy who wants to get the, the attention of the, of the ox or the donkey, and he gets a two before and he slams him in the head. He got his attention. He made something clear to him. 
Well, manifest gets the idea. And Jesus says, I have, mani- I have made clear, I have I've popped these guys. I've manifested to them your name to the men you've given me out of the world. So you think about Matthew and you think about John and James and Peter and Thomas and Simon and all these guys. They were given to the Son out of the world. Remember in John chapter 1 when John the Baptist was preaching and he's preparing them for the coming of the Messiah and Jesus is walking along the shore? And John pointed and he said what? Look, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And and two of his disciples stopped following John and began following Jesus. That was Andrew and John. They began following him. And then they went and found uh, uh, Andrew and James. They went and found John. And then they went and found Philip. And they found Nathaniel. And then later on they found Thomas. And all, one by one, all the others came. They had all 12 of them there following Jesus. Following him. I've manifested your name to these men that you've given me. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you've given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So all those sermons Jesus preached, all the parables he taught, all the teaching that he taught came from the Father. We've seen that before. He said, the words that I speak to you, they're not my words. They come from the Father. This sermon here, chapter 14, 15, and 16 in John, this sermon, Comes from the Father to the Son. He says, I've, verse 8, I've given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received. The, by the way, the word received. You know, if you, if you go, if the, you get a knock at the door. And it's the mailman. And he has a little package for you or something. Or it's too big for your mailbox. And he blew the horn and you didn't come out. So he has to put the part put the truck in park, get out, come down the driveway, knock on your door, and you see and you open the door, he's you got a package for you, and you take it. And, I wonder who sent this. And you say, oh, okay, that's cool. You, you just take it. But on the other hand, when your wife, on your birthday, or your anniversary, or your husband, on your anniversary, or some other notable day, says to you, I've got something for you. And you say, well, what is it? Uh, I just want to give it to you. Because it shows how much I love you. And he reaches in his pocket, or she reaches in her purse and pulls out this little thing and hands it to you. Or you can just say, oh, that's nice, and throw it on the kitchen table. That's what you do with the mailman. Oh, okay, this belongs to Susie. Oh, this is mine. I'll get it later. You know, I'll open it up later. But when you get that gift that you know is special, you're going to receive it with eagerness. In fact, the word receive here means to grab. You tear it out of their hands. (laughs) What is it? You see, that's the idea. I have given to them the words which you've given me, and they have grabbed them. They've embraced them. They've taken them. And have known surely I came forth from you. They understand the incarnation. They understand that my life did not begin in Bethlehem town. My life began in heaven. Didn't even begin. I've always been God. I've always existed. My life never began. I'm an eternal God with the Father. And now I came to earth. And they've accepted that. And they've known that I came forth. And they have believed that you sent me. They knew a lot. How did they know a lot? Because Jesus had preached the word and the Holy Spirit had done what? Opened up their eyes. There's a lot of things these guys didn't understand. But the deity of Christ wasn't one of them. Man, they were a little confused about the return, I'll grant you. They little, little understand, didn't understand a whole lot about him going back to heaven and establish the kingdom later on. 
He didn't understand that the coming of Christ and the kingdom was in two parts, the first coming and the second coming. They didn't know about all that. That was some kind of a mystery to them. Paul will explain that to them later and John. But right now, as far as the incarnation of Jesus Christ, they were spot on with that. They knew the Father had sent him. They knew he had come down. He, they knew it had been, been with the Father. They knew who he was. And they had received and grabbed and embraced the words what the Father had given, him, given them. He says in verse 9, I pray for them. Wow. Can you imagine what these guys must have thought? They're sitting there. Their hearts have been broken. Their hearts have been troubled. And he had been preaching now for three chapters, 14, 15, 16. Preaching. Now he's praying for them. And he says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. And all Mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I'm glorified. In... Let me ask you a question. Are y'all feeling secure today in your salvation? You should be. You were a gift of the Father to the Son, and the Father's not an Indian giver. No givesy backsies. The Father gave you to his Son. You were the father's. It was the father's right to do with you whatever he wanted to do. All mine are yours. Yours are mine. I am glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world. He's on his way out. But these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given me that they may be one as we are. That is a prayer of Jesus Christ to his Father. And the Father never, never does not answer the prayer of the Son. The Father's not going to say, well, I don't know, Jesus, that's a pretty good idea, keeping these guys through your name, uh, that they may be one with us. Yeah, I don't know, though. You know... That Jim Grasty guy, I don't know. There's been some times in his life, you know, he just really didn't measure up. You know, uh, there's, you know, there, he, he kind of let me down a little bit. Anybody can say that? Everybody in this room, right? You think Peter did everything right? You think John and James did everything right? You think Paul did everything right? Remember James and John, they wanted to call down fire on the whole country. Burn them up. Samaria. That received the gospel just a few months later, and the church was born, and they received the Holy Spirit. Good thing he didn't call down fire. They wanted to. But he says, keep them through your name, that they may be one as we are. He says in verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you, have, you gave, get, did, are you seeing this idea? Giving me, giving me, giving me. Here it is again, verse, verse, uh, verse 2. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. None of them is lost except the son of perdition. Who was he? Judas. Well, how, how can you say then that none is, he kept them all except for Judas? Well, because that was predetermined in history, in, in the past. Look what he says. None of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. And I didn't mean to go that far. But remember, the scripture talks about the son of perdition being destroyed. And so Judas's betrayal, Judas's death, was prophesied in the Old Testament. Had nothing to do with God's inability to keep him had nothing to do with Jesus' inability to keep him. The guy didn't have to be kept. You know why? Because the guy never was given to the son. Judas was not one of the chosen ones. You say, well, why was he part of the 11 or the 12? You'll have to ask God when you get there. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I just know that there's a passage in the scripture about those, someone who will betray the Messiah, lift up his foot, his heel against him, and that has to be fulfilled. I think Judas was there because every word of Scripture has to be fulfilled. 
There's not a part in the word. He's, well, I was going to fulfill that, but really, I, you know, I, I couldn't let one of the 12 go. No. Scripture has to be upheld. And Judas is the one, unfortunately, who fell, fell to that. But he was a son of perdition, a son of destruction. That description might be fulfilled. Verse 13. But now I come to you in these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Here's again, again, a reference to a sermon. Remember last week we saw all the times he said these things, these things, these things. He says, um, let's see, I think I got it somewhere here. Um, yeah, um, you know what? I'm going to say that for later on in the chapter. I don't get ahead of myself. So he says here, He's already said, glorify, you know, glorify me, glorify, I'm going to glorify you, glorify myself. Now he's saying, I want you to keep them through their name. There's a, there's a, a uh, trying to get some synonyms here that uh, kind of match. So you got glorify and then keep. So I couldn't find a word that had phi. I mean, he talks about sanctify, verse 17. We can talk about that in a little bit. Glorify, sanctify, unify. So I took the idea of keep or guard and I made it protectify. Is that good? <laughs> I looked in the dictionary. I couldn't find it. It's a new word. I just made it up. Glorify, protect or protectify my disciples. Keep them. Sanctify them. Verse 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified by the truth. You see, all the word of God, what does sanctify mean? It means to set apart and make holy. It means to set apart for a holy purpose. It's to sanctify and make holy. When that sanctification is that long, lifelong process that begins the moment that you're born again. The moment you're justified by faith, God starts you on that road of sanctification. And it doesn't end to glorification. But it's that process by which we begin to become more like Jesus in our character, in our heart, in our thinking. And we're being more from, we're changed from one degree of glory into the other. Paul told the Corinthian church that you stare into Scripture. You stare into, the, into Scripture and the veil is taken away. And as you gaze into it, the perfect law of liberty, we're transformed into the same image from glory into glory. Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, I commit you unto God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and sanctify you. Jesus says, Father, I have given them your word. I have preached your word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is, that's why he calls the Holy Spirit. How many times? The spirit of truth. He'll take you the things of mine and show it unto you. He'll bring you all things I said to your remembrance. He will teach you. He will instruct you. He will change you. He will empower you. You abide in me. You will bear the fruit of the spirit. Set them apart by your truth. The word of God will set you, it will make you holy, change you. It will sanctify you. Your word is truth. He's been speaking truth. They're filled with the spirit of truth. I was, um, wanted you to see what he said here uh, about the, these things. Chapter 15. Chapter 15, look at uh, verse 11. And these things I spoken to you, that my joy may remain. Do you think they needed joy on that last night? Yeah, they needed a lot of joy. And he says, well, this sermon I'm preaching gives you joy. Because it tells you, even though I'm going away and I'm going to die, it's telling you that the program is not coming to an end. There's still a plan. I'm going to be glorified. You're going to be glorified. Salvation has been purchased. It's been wrought. It's going to be yours, eternal. So he says, I, uh, I, I speak these things that you might have joy. Their hearts are troubled. 
but he wants them to have joy. In chapter 15, verse 17, he says this, These things I sp- command you that you love one another. So he's been given the words and commanded that they will love one another. So they have joy, they have love. And then in verse chapter 16, verse 1, he said these, These things I've spoken to you that you should learn that you should not be made to stumble. If you stumble, what's the opposite of stumble? Stand, would you say, Diana? No, the opposite of, of okay. Uh, the opposite of stumble. Standing, standing firm, stability. He says, I'm speaking these words that you would have stability. I spoke these words you might have love. I spoke these you might have joy. Verse 33 in chapter 16, he says, These things I spoke to you that in me you might have peace. They need peace tonight. They're, they're all in an uproar. They're disturbed. He says, In the world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And I'm speaking to you. The word of God that you might have joy, love, stability, and peace, and edification, and Christ-likeness. So no wonder he could say in chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them by your word, your truth, your word is truth. Paul told, told young Pastor Timothy, study, be diligent to show yourself uh, a student of the word of truth, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the word of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Every time you read the Bible, folks, you're reading truth. Verse 18, as you sent me in the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Jesus set himself apart. When he left heaven... He set himself apart. No more would he live with the Father as he had before. Before the incarnation, did Jesus have a human body? No. He was spirit, just like the Father, like the Son, like the He was invisible. But he became flesh. And he has a, he's in a body today. The same body that he appeared in the upper room and he said, touch my hands, touch my side. The same body on the shore of, of, uh, of Sea of Galilee where he, he cooked that breakfast and the disciples jumped, came to shore and Peter jumped and swam to shore and he had fish and all, he ate. That same, that same body that they saw go up into heaven, Acts chapter 1, and the cloud received him out of The same body where he's appearing, he appears. If something appears, it has what? It has mass. His body, uh, he's appearing night and day before the Father, making intercession for you and me. And one day, he's going to leave, he's going to come back, and every eye is going to what? See him. He's in a human body forever and ever. He sanctified himself, folks, for you and for me. He gave up. That which he can never have again by becoming a man. He set, sanctified himself that you and I might be sanctified by the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of salvation, the truth of, of justification by faith and, and salvation and, and all the things that Jesus brought to explain to us and all the things the New Testament has for us. Look at verse 20. Here's the third and last part. I got to hurry. I do not pray for these alone. I'm not just praying for these 11 guys, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I got saved through the word of John the Apostle as I read in the Gospel of John about who Jesus was in chapter 1. How the word became, I never, I never knew any of that. I told you what I thought Jesus was, somebody that God adopted. Just saw him running around Jerusalem, that's a cute guy, I think I'll adopt, make him my son. That's what I thought. I had no idea that before Bethlehem, Jesus existed in heaven, and he came to earth. There's, that I didn't know. I didn't know that. I had to read it through the Apostle John, his words. 
and, of course, Paul and, and the others. He's, but they may, that they may believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. Now, get this. Talk about salvation is eternal security. I do not pray for these alone, but I'm praying also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them, you in me, that they may be, may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Wow. That's amazing. I get the picture at a seminary professor. He brought a mixing bowl to class one day, and he set this big mixing bowl. And he poured flour in there. And he poured uh, a little oil in there. And he poured some uh, uh, sugar in there, butter or something like that. He put three ingredients, oil, flour, and something else, and he mixed it all together. And then he said, come up here and separate it. Can't. This is the idea. That oil, that flour, that, that, um, that sh butter, whatever it was, it's all one. Jesus says, And the glory which you've given me, I've given them, that they may be one just as we are, I in them, you in me, that they may be, per be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Friends, if you're saved, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he rose again from the dead, you believe that, and you're born again, you can't be lost. Because you're one with Jesus, he's one with you, you're both one with the Father, and you can't extract, you can't get that, you can't divide it. That's our salvation. It's eternal. And then he prays finally in verse 24, Father, what a great prayer. What a close. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, gave me, be with me. Now, didn't he talk about that in chapter 14? Isn't that how he started this whole thing, chapter 14? Let not your heart be troubled. I go prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to myself that what? Where I am, you'll be also. Here he's praying about that. I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. And when Jesus has spoken these words, he didn't even say amen. When he spoke those words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And you know the story. He went down, he went off, and he fell on his knees, and he prayed. And he prayed so three times, and blood, like sweat, like drops of blood fell on him. You know, and he wanted uh, Peter, James, and John to, to pray with him. But what did they do? They fell asleep. At least they fell, fell asleep after the sermon, not during the sermon. But they fell asleep. And he woke up, can you not wait, watch just one hour? Just watch. They're just falling asleep. They need some coffee. And then what happened? After the third prayer, there's a disturbance. They hear the gate rattle, and they see torches coming, and a great crowd. And who's leading the crowd? Judas. Judas. They got torches and spears and swords and staves. Staves are like clubs. And they came in, and he said, and, and Judas kissed him to betray him. And they said, are you Jesus? And they all fell to the ground because he said what? I am. I am. Well, I could go on another hour.
but I better not. So I want to thank y'all for your um, faithfulness. I want to thank y'all for giving me two extra weeks. I could have taken four, um, but didn't want to do that. Didn't want to take advantage of your generosity, your schedule. Thank you. Uh, do me a favor, if you would, please pray for um, the study in this coming, the summer Bible study in July and August. I'm really wrestling with what to do. I think I know what I'm going to do. I think. I'm not going to tell you. But it's an Old Testament book, very unusual book. Very unusual book. In fact, it's unlike any book in the Old Testament. But we're going to study that. I think that's what we're going to do. Not positive, but would you pray, Lord, if that's the book you want Jim to do, would you just make it clear to him? If that's not what the Lord wants me to do, then show me you know, something else. Okay? But I need something a little simpler than what we just did. I've got to give my brain a rest. Uh, I really do. You know, so. All right, we're going to have prayer, and then come up here as you leave, and I'll give you your notebook, okay? Father, I want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the Son of God. Thank you, Lord, for everyone here who knows Jesus as Savior. I want to thank you for that day. I woke up that morning, Father, lost, blind, dead, separated from God. I've been going to church for about six or seven weeks, hearing the gospel. My heart was closed. I went out after prayer meeting that night and got drunk. Got home that night, about 1 o'clock in the morning, got into bed. And like a blaze of light, Father, suddenly I understood. And I got out of bed and got on my knees and asked Jesus to save me. And he did. I'm just so thankful, Father. I think every day, and I probably bore folks in my testimony, but I can't help it. I think about it every day. And I appreciate so much what you've done for me. And I just pray for each one here that we would value, treasure our salvation. We, whether we were in kindergarten as children or vacation Bible school or in the military or wherever it was, we got saved. May we thank you and just be thrilled that we're saved, even if we can't remember the exact moment because we might have been too young. Jesus told the disciples who came back real that they could cast out demons and raise the dead and heal people. And he said, don't be excited that the demons are subject unto you. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's, that really is what makes us excited that we're saved. Now, Lord... Uh, Thank you for those who have been so faithful. And uh, pray that you got me about the summer Bible study coming up in July. I'll be here quicker than I think. And um, now just dismiss us with your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on up. Yeah, yeah.